Uh, today, we're going to be focused on what the United States government, and namely the Trump administration, has been saying and doing to address these issues in the context of Russia on a bilateral basis, as well as to see where the rhetoric meets the road. Um, as we know, Trump has repeatedly expressed desire to improve U.S.-Russia relations. Um, nevertheless, policies thus far towards the Trump, uh, during the Trump administration have been less than friendly to Putin's regime, including uh, quietly approving the first sale of lethal arms to Ukraine, which is a departure from the Obama administration's de facto legal arms embargo. And as we know, the recent escalation of sanctions has further shaken the Kremlin elite. Uh, despite all this, it's natural to contrast the president's rhetoric with concrete policy achievements. Where does Trump the man diverge from Trump administration? How does that affect the way Moscow reacts to American policies? Does the United States even have a coherent Russia policy outside of sanctions? And is our relationship to Russia today really any different than it would be under President Clinton? To speak to some of these questions, as well as placing them in historical context, uh, we have here today three distinguished panelists. Their full biographies can be found in your folders, um, but I will introduce them briefly. Um, to my left, I have Herman Perchner. He's the founding president of the American Foreign Policy Council. Um, next is Dr. Alina Polyakova, the David M. Rubenstein Fellow in the Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institution. And finally, uh, Yulia Latinina, a journalist with Echo Moskvi and Nova Gazeta, uh, some of the few remaining Russian independent news outlets. So to start out, uh, each of us are going to make a statement to start, and we'll get into some discussion and then a question and answer session from the audience. Uh, and a note to those of you on your phones, so all of you, uh, our Twitter handle is at HelsinkiCom, C-O-M-M. Uh, if you would like to tweet about it, and you can also like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Helsinki Commission. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Mr. Perchner. Okay. As a student, <clears throat> when I first started thinking, oops. as a student, when I first started thinking about politics, Richard Nixon was president. And I remember reading an article in The Economist where Nixon was telling his supporters don't pay any attention to what I say, watch what I do. And I think as uh, Rachel indicated, we're in a time where many people have started paying more attention to what Trump says than what he does. Actually, I think both formulations are incorrect. What is done is very important, but what is said also carries weight and has to be considered as part of overall policy. Briefly, what has he done? From the time that he came into office, there have been a long series of moves that can be regarded only as very unfriendly to the Putin regime. Uh, in uh, April of 2017, he bombed Syria uh, after you have uh, the use of chemical weapons against uh, Russian objections. In August, uh, he signed a bill uh, they place sanctions on a variety of uh, Russian industries. Uh, September 2017, training exercise in the Baltic states. December 2017, sanctions on the great Putin ally and Chechen warlord Kadyrov. Uh, 2017 December, the sale of sniper systems, which by the way is uh, more important than you think because at the time the range of sniper systems that Russia had and were using against Ukraine had a much longer range and therefore uh, Ukrainians could not adequately uh, defend against these sniper attacks. Um, more recently in March of 18, you had uh, following the Skripal poisonings, five Russian entities and 19 individuals uh, were sanctioned. Later, 60 Russian diplomats were kicked out of Russia. In March, the Javelin missiles uh, went to Ukraine. Uh, these are anti-tank missiles and reduce the chance of uh, uh, a Russian uh, advance. Certainly would raise the cost of any further military action. In April, sanctions against seven members of the Putin elite, including Putin's son-in-law and Oleg Deripaska, who is uh, 
known to be very close to the Kremlin. Uh, in April, when um, the Wagner Group, which is uh, really under Putin's control, uh, moved against American positions in Syria, we launched an attack killing perhaps a few hundred uh, ethnic Russians, Russian citizens. So the response has been uh, uh, tough to actual uh, Putin actions. Now, some people have made the counter argument that this is only because Trump has been pushed into these positions. But who was pushing him? The people that uh, had uh, long documented pro-Russian positions, Bannon, uh, First National Security Advisor, they have been pushed out. Who has been picked by Trump since? You have Pompeo at state, you have Bolton at the National Security Council, and before that you had Mathis, all with demonstrably tough lines against um, the Putin administration. So you have to, if you think that uh, uh, he's being pushed by these people, remember that he's the person that pushed, uh, that promoted them, that appointed them, and he did so with the knowledge of their longstanding positions against uh, the Russian regime. Now, having said that, uh, confusing signals have been sent. We have the uh, recent statement that Russia should be readmitted to the G7 to make it G8 again. You have a constant uh, uh, reluctance to criticize Russian actions and especially uh, Putin directly. How does that play into the hard line that's been taken in practice? Uh, in the kindest interpretation, uh, it perhaps encourages uh, Europe to rearm, to uh, begin to take care of its own defense, uh, to look at the danger that comes from Russia. In the unkindest interpretation, it's a signal that maybe when the actual big summit happens between uh, Putin and uh, uh, Trump, that Trump won't hold the hard line. And this uh, insecurity, uh, which would be caused among American allies and American friends in the world, could well, well leave those uh, countries to hedge their bets to make an accommodation with Russia. It all depends on how Putin's or how Trump's words are read. And uh, in the words of Don Rumsfeld, I think what Trump is really thinking is a known unknown. I don't believe it's possible to get inside of uh, Trump's head to know what he's doing. I'm reminded of a uh, scene from the movie Patton where the famous American World War II general addresses his senior commanders before a battle and he goes into a rage and says, "Don't anybody, nobody should come back alive uh, if we can't secure victory. And when all the generals and colonels leave the room, Patton's top aide turns to him and says, sir, you have to understand that uh, our officers don't know when you're kidding and not kidding. And Patton replies, it's not necessary for them to know, I have to know. So uh, my bottom line on this is uh, we have to hope that when uh, Trump is making all these statements on Russia, that he does know what he's doing, because if he doesn't, then uh, it could lead to things that are not too uh, attractive. Um, Maybe a couple words on where I think policy should go before turning it over to my uh, colleagues. Solzhenitsyn, talking about the Soviet Union, said that uh, such a system can only exist on the big lie. And where, while Putin's Russia is certainly not the Soviet Union, uh, the lie is important to keeping him in power. That's why all the internal and external propaganda and uh, the West has done a very bad job about countering that propaganda, both inside in Russia and externally. I think we can't uh, uh, overstate really how effective this propaganda is, even among those in the Russian elite that understand that propaganda is being made. In the early 90s, uh, after the breakup of the Soviet Union, I hosted a prominent Russian economist who's clearly part of the elite, his first time in the U.S., and I took him to an up-end grocery store. And this was at a time where you couldn't, with a thousand bucks, buy a banana in Moscow, and even if you went to 
the party stores, which only party members could go into, it was not a very impressive array of food. And he looked at it for a while uh, and said, well, that's just how you rich people live. Then I took him to a Safeway in one of the poorest neighborhoods of Washington. And he looked at all the food there, and he was very silent. And finally he said to me, he said, you know, I had access to a lot of things from the West. And uh, I, I thought I knew, but till now I didn't understand how much I'd been lied to. And I think this is true very much of uh, the Russian people and even the Russian elites and this lack of uh, understanding reality in my mind leads very much to some of the predatory Russian policies today. It has to be uh, counteracted. We also have to step up the pressure on the elites around Putin. Uh, public opinion counts in Russia, but what really counts is opinion of a couple hundred slash KGB oligarchs that surround Putin. They're, who keeps, they're the people who keep him in power. Now, many of these people uh, not just did legitimate business, but worked very hard to steal uh, their money. And if you want to know what they think about the future of Russia, what any elite thinks about the future of the country, look what they do with their money and look what they do with their children. All these people in Russia have two, maybe three or four passports. They all have foreign bank accounts. They often have children abroad. And why? Because they don't know when things could go bad for them in Russia. There's no protection of law. Why? Because they don't know when Russia itself could go bad and they want a place uh, to go where they can begin to live large. But the current Russian policies and uh, increasing isolation of Russia from the West has begun to crimp their lifestyle and it becomes hard for them to enjoy their hard stolen money in Europe. It becomes hard for them to do business. And uh, while nobody I think is willing to stick, or this crowd is willing to raise their head to challenge Putin, Putin certainly understands that there is unease and at some point that unease will become a big problem for him. So to the extent that we can use the people around him to put pressure on Putin, we stand a better chance of improving relations. Because Putin is the type of guy whose appetite is increased by the eating. And if he doesn't find very hard reasons uh, to stop, things that cause him problem, he's not going to stop. And uh, we, the pressure, to my mind, has to be increased. Additionally, uh, things like javelins to Ukraine, things like putting uh, NATO troops in Poland and the Balts are real reminders of American commitment. And to the extent that the Russian elite understands that there is a firm commitment, there's less chance that we will have fighting with Russia, and there's a greater chance that some reasonable accommodation can be made, and there's a sound, there can become a sound basis for uh, improving the relationship. Uh, so Herman took a lot of my talking points already, but uh, I'll try to add to those a little bit. Uh, but I think it it's also says something that uh, we actually agree on, on the basic premise that you outlined. And I think that is also a significant uh, thing to note. Um, right now we have, in the United States, uh, the toughest Russia policy since the end of the Cold War, but if you just read the president's tweets, you would never know it. And that's the reality of the phenomena of decoupling between president's statements on Russia, uh, which have been, as Herman also pointed out, uh, more favorable, uh, positive towards Mr. Putin, towards uh, the Russian government, and then the actual policy actions of this administration. So Herman and, and Rachel started to highlight some of those policy actions, but I think it's actually much larger than we even uh, can understand if we just look at very discrete things that happen month to month. Since January 2017, there have actually been 26 distinct policy actions that this administration has launched uh, in relation to Russia. Uh, in some, there are 205 new sanctions against Russian entities and individuals. The largest expulsion of Russian uh, so-called diplomats in history of the United States, including Cold War history. Uh, this is significant. 
Uh, in addition to that, the national defense strategy, national um, security strategy clearly points to Russia as a adversary and a competitor to the United States uh, alongside with China. We can quibble about whether Russia and China should actually be on the same level as uh, competitors to the United States, but the reality is that this is a profound shift in how the U.S. sees its place in the world and how the U.S. sees uh, its relationship vis-a-vis -vis Russia specifically. And this is a shift from what we've seen under um, Obama, Bush, uh, Clinton, and going all the way back. And I think the other issues that I would highlight that's significant is the NDAA. Uh, we just uh, went through markup on the Senate. And if we look at uh, funding to shore up Europe's East, uh, the European Deterrence Initiative that used to be called the European Reassurance Initiative, uh, that was started under President Obama. In 2017, 3.4 billion was allocated to EDI. In the 2019 NDAA, the amount uh, has been approved by the Senate at 6.3 billion, which is almost a three billion increase um, in just a period of two years. Uh, these funds look a lot like uh, they reflect a strategy of very traditional deterrence against Russia. Uh, they reflect an investment in NATO's eastern flank, an investment in uh, protecting and expanding U.S. presence, forward presence in the Baltic states, uh, also in Ukraine. There's an additional 200 million allocated uh, and authorized for U.S. military training and support of Ukraine. Uh, this is separate from the weapon sales, the javelin sales that the Herman also talked about. So if we take the whole broad spectrum of what this administration has done on Russia, it is a significant and important set of actions and activities that, as I said, looks a lot like a very traditional deterrent strategy that I would argue we probably would have had, though I don't like uh, hypotheticals or counterfactuals, a pretty similar strategy or set of actions um, under uh, Hillary Clinton if she had won the presidency. Now, we don't know for sure, and I think the one profound difference is that, of course, uh, it does matter what the president says. And what the president has been saying, though his administration has not been doing, uh, has per, um, started to draw and ignite certain rifts and tensions in the transatlantic relationship. Uh, and that is a serious issue that I don't think we would have had uh, had we had a different president. Uh, the biggest example that we just saw that I think encapsulates, on the one hand, the decoupling that I've talked about between rhetoric and action, uh, but also the kinds of problems and tensions that this administration will continue to have, particularly Western European allies, is of course what just happened in the G7, where basically one day you have the president suggesting that Russia should be readmitted, uh, your uh, G7 allies saying no, uh, and then within, I think, hours of that, uh, you have the Director of National Intelligence, Dan Coates, giving a speech. I was actually at the speech where he gave it in France, uh, outlining a very, very hawkish and very tough Russia policy. This is within hours of the President's tweets. And then you have an additional set of sanctions imposed on Russian entities and tech firms who uh, the U.S. government has charged as being enablers uh, in, in Russian cyber attacks and uh, intelligence gathering operations. And this all happened within 24 hours. And so I think we are in a situation where European allies, uh, and I go to Europe quite often, I s don't understand who to listen to in this administration. Should they be paying attention to the president's tweets? Should they be listening to what Secretary Mattis or uh, Director uh, Dan Coates says? I think this is, this is producing a certain set of confusion with our uh, key allies in Europe. I think this is going to be kind of a continuing pattern that we'll see throughout this administration. So that being said, uh, just a few words on policy. Uh, and I, I completely agree with what Herman outlined in terms of where this should be heading. Where we are today is that we have a very conventional uh, deterrence, possibly the beginning of a containment strategy vis-a-vis -vis Russia. This administration is not communicating that very clearly. They could do a better job of that. It's clear to me that the National Security Advisor and also the Secretary of State um, and the Secretary of Defense are aligned on their views of Russia. And there also is continued bipartisan support in Congress on 
uh, a, a much tougher approach to Russia. This was, of course, culminated in the CATSA legislation the president signed, which, you know, nothing, almost nothing ever passes Congress, it seems, with almost unanimous support. And this was the one bill that did. And I think this is really, really important. We shouldn't forget that this happened. But we're not really thinking about next steps, meaning right now the U.S. and also Europeans are using existing policy tools, uh, primarily sanctions, expulsions, uh, and various other elements of those two policy implements. But we're not thinking about how to get ahead of the emerging threat that Russia and China represent to the United States. And those emerging threats are not going to be in the conventional military space. Yes, Russia is a nuclear superpower, so is the United States. Uh, I don't think we're going to be entering a nuclear war with Russia anytime soon. That's not in the Russian interest, that's not in the U.S. interest. But it's become very clear that Russia tries to balance out its own asymmetries against the West, meaning the fact that uh, the Russian military cannot compete with the Western alliance, uh, meaning that the Russian economy cannot compete with the West either. And they try to balance against these imbalances in sort of the more conventional space by investing in its capabilities in the asymmetrical space. So things like hybrid war, right? Uh, these gray zone activities, disinformation, cyber attacks, uh, using uh, energy as a tool to try to continue European dependence uh, on Russian uh, gas, uh, specifically the Nord Stream 2 project. Uh, these kinds of activities, we have not developed a good set of deterrent strategies against, uh, specifically when it comes to things like disinformation in digital domain and potential cyber attacks. In uh, March of this year, the FBI and DHS released a joint report that found the same malware that existed on Ukraine's electrical grids and caused a massive blackout in Ukraine uh, two years ago uh, on the critical infrastructure grids in this country, including nuclear, waterways, um, electrical, et cetera. What this looks like to me is that the Russian proxies, say the Russian government, uh, has basically planted cyber bombs on our critical infrastructure systems. And so the question is, how will we respond to that kind of provocation? I do think it's a provocation. Have we responded to that provocation? Those things remain relatively unclear to me. So aside from developing our strategies in the asymmetric space, we also need to be thinking about um, how do we target the Russian elite uh, who have been stealing massive amounts of money from the Russian people uh, in a way that doesn't actually hurt uh, the living standards or uh, the views of the Russian people towards the West or towards the United States. And going after the oligarchs, as this administration has done with targeted sanctions, uh, is a good first step, but it's not enough because it's very easy to get around those sanctions. Uh, most people that are billionaires can easily transfer their wealth over to if not their grandmothers, uh, their girlfriends, uh, cousins, whoever else. And we have to work much harder to be able to maintain that sanctions regime. This administration has uh, dissolved the Office of the Sanctions uh, Coordinator in the State Department. And it's not clear they've replaced that office and with a, another, uh, another unit that would be involved in doing this. And this is something that I think I would encourage the administration to consider doing as sanctions become a bigger part of U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia and other countries. Uh, but exposing the kinds of corruption that not just uh, Putin, but those individuals close to him that compose the Kremlin elite uh, is absolutely critical to trying to draw some cracks among the Kremlin elite and among the oligarchic system that this government in Russia has set up to the detriment of its own people. And I think we shouldn't forget that, that whenever we're talking about Russia, we're not talking about, at least I'm not talking about, the Russian people. I'm talking about the regime, uh, which is a kleptocratic, patrimonial, oligarchic system um, that functions basically as a parasite of uh, the Russian people and the assets of the, the, the Russian economy. So I will stop there. Uh, well, it takes gumption to speak about American policy towards Russia to an American audience being Russian. 
Uh, so I'd better stick to the Russian side of the equation. And first I would like to underline the fact that Russia belongs to a never widening circle of countries, and most of them failed or rogue states that live by hate in America. And this sort of takes place of Saturn in their picture of the world. And that Saturn is responsible for everything, including the shortage of toilet paper in Venezuela shops. And basically, it's, uh, and basically the worse the situation gets inside the country, the more desperately it needs the Saturn to explain away its problems. For instance, Kremlin really believes the United States uh, stand behind the Islamic extremists in Russian Caucasus. They really believe that the United States are behind Russian opposition, and their symbol of faith is that the United States created ISIS. Uh, it's a very wild picture of the world, obviously, and it's very hard to, to have a productive policy towards the country with psychic issues. Because, well, how do you behave towards an abusive neighbor who, say, likes to crap on your lawn, or who tortures your cat? If you try to accommodate him, he will think you are a weakling, and he'll use the ground gained as a forward base for the new attacks. And if you, you retaliate, he'll say to his family, see, we're surrounded by enemies. So basically, there is no good diplomatic strategy in dealing with Mr. Putin, like there are no good diplomatic strategies in dealing with violent Islamists, because both are worst type of aggressors, an aggressor who claims to be a victim. And this is bad news. Uh, the good news is that hybrid war we are talking so much about against the West is not actually Putin's invention, it is a Soviet invention. And I think there is simply no comparison between Soviet hybrid war and the current Russian one. Because the old Soviet subversion machine, especially in the 30s, was really powerful. These were the days of Harry Dexter White, of Alger Hiss, of Lawrence Duggan. These were the days when half of American China hands were Soviet spies. And worse, they were not just spying, they were directing policies. These were the days when people like Ernst Hemingway were used as useful idiots by, United, by USSR. And people like my favorite uh, detective writer, Dashiell Hammett, were simple and pure communists. So we have nothing comparable nowadays. Because when Stalin stood up and said that Moscow trials of 1937 is the real thing, he was believed by half of European intellectuals. It was unfashionable not to believe Stalin, as uh, then as it is not to believe in global warming today. Uh, when Russia, right now, Russia stands up and says, uh, for instance, uh, that Skripals were injected with chemical agent after they came to hospital, as a Soviet representative, in, or this Russian representative in the United Nations claimed, well, it's just hilarious. So basically my premise is if the open society survived the Soviet hybrid war, it will certainly survive Putin. The second important thing about the hybrid war is that you cannot really win it. You can wreak havoc on somebody you consider your enemy, but you get no gains economic territorial for yourself. And we can also see that Russian hybrid war is not directed to support or this or that person. What actually numerous investigations found that Russia did not support Trump per se. It supported those whom it considered to be the most disruptive and divisive. This is why it supported Trump, why it supported Bernie Sanders over Hillary. It supported every divisive view. It supported Black Lives Matter and white supremacists, militant Islamists and violent Islamophobia. Moreover, the minute Trump won, Russia switched its support to Trump bashes, and actually we know that the most successful public event ever organized by Russian trolls was a public anti-Trump rally organized on November 12, 2018, just four days after his victory. Thousands attended, including filmmaker George Michael Moore, who played actually a role of an unwitting useful idiot. Actually, this makes us wonder, because when Kremlin so publicly and demonstratively supported Trump's victory, was this just a visceral reaction to Hillary's defeat? Because by this time, she was undoubtedly personally hated by Kremlin? Or this a more strategic plane when Kremlin, perfectly aware of its reputation, was expressly using its alleged support in order to weaken the institution of American presidency? Otherwise speaking, I think that the current job is doing, I'm completely in agreement, is doing a very good job of containing something that's really hard to contain. And its most important achievement, actually, I think, is not sanctions. 
It's the military containment, mm -hmm. and that's precisely what lacked during the previous administration. I would remind you that Putin embarked on, the, on a blatant career of hybrid aggression in year 2008 in the cause of Russo-Georgian war. It was an open act of aggression against a sovereign nation. It was carried out exactly in the same manner as all things Putin later did in Ukraine. For Putin operated through cutouts and volunteers, through the runaway Republic of South Ossetia. He was an aggressor supposing to be a victim, and he was claiming that the real aggressors are the United States. In Kremlin's point of view, they stood behind Saakashvili, and Russian media were telling that U.S. fighter pilots attacked Hinvali. This is the capital uh, of this runaway republic. And actually, I do remember a press conference in which none other than a deputy commander of Russian general staff produced a passport of an American citizen, uh, the citizen in case was Michael Lee White, as a proof that it was the U.S. military who were fighting Russians in Georgia. This was classic vintage fake news, for it was later proved that this Michael Lee White, he lived in China for 10 years, his passport was stolen from him in year 2005 when he transited from Beijing to United States via Moscow. And after all this, President Obama announced the reset policy. And by doing so in Kremlin's eyes, he was a weakling. Moreover, in Kremlin's eyes, that meant he acknowledged the basic Kremlin narrative about the war, that is the narrative that the United States was somehow responsible. In Kremlin's eyes, he said, oh yes, we did all these things, you claim we did, and we are sorry. He acknowledged that Michael Lee White was fighting in Georgia. And I think if there were no reset, there would have been no Crimea annexation. We can see this story repeating itself in August 2013, when Assad used chemical weapons against thousands of civilians and crossed the red line. Instead of bombing the hell out of Assad, President Obama said that he will explore other options, and these other options involved President Putin's offer to act as intermediary. Putin volunteered to supervise the destruction of Assad chemical weapons. Well, we all know that Assad kept his chemical weapons. And I'm not criticizing uh, American administration. I'm just saying that this was basically one way to deal with a wild neighbor who pisses on, the lo on your lawn and tortures your cat. You try to engage him, and you get more aggression in return. And by year 2014, Putin was thinking he can get away with anything. So after year 2014, after uh, Crimea annexation, and especially after Putin tried to meddle in US elections, were in phase two, the police has been called for the wild neighbor, the wild neighbor got his due, and Russia is under sanctions. Actually, does this save the situation? Well, no, because Putin is using sanctions to build up hysteria inside Russia. Kremlin is saying we are surrounded by enemies, they love us not. Uh, actually, an even worse thing is happening because prior to 2014, main Putin support base was Russian elite who, as you put it, stole in Russia and kept money in the West. Now, and that's unfortunate, and that's part of the sanctions, this support base is shitting more and more towards underclass, towards the poor people who have never been in the West, never seen it, never had any money, and who want a reason for all their suffering. And they get this reason. Yeah, we are suffering, but this is because in the West, they in the West, they hate us. And why do they hate us? Oh, because we are so spiritual. Does this mean that sanctions are counterproductive? Of course not. That's the same conundrum society is faced when dealing with criminals. Every social worker with his metal will tell you that it is counterproductive to put a criminal in jail. And jail is a bad place, it does no good, Yes, jail is a very, very bad way to deal with criminals, not counting all the others. And you can say the same about Kremlin. Sanctions are a very bad way to deal with Kremlin, not counting all the others. But the most important point I would like to point out is that the only effective strategy is not sanctions. It is the military containment. And we can point to, to very significant developments it, they have been talked already about by Herman and by Alina. The first was Deir Azor, when uh, on April 8th, around 200 Russians were wiped out by US airstrikes. 
because they attacked United States positions and the positions of the Allies. And actually, this, by this time, Kremlin was telling for years on end that the United States are attacking Russia. And we would have supposed all hell to break loose on Russian TV. Instead, there was not a peep. Why? Precisely because it was a humiliating defeat. And because the United States acted and not talked. If the United States were to issue a notice, address the issue, convene the United Nations, I guess there would have been very strong Russian reaction. Where 200 Russians were just killed, there was zero reaction. And then, of course, we had the red line story once over again this April, when President Trump ordered the airstrikes against Assad, and Russia made a great show and issued a lot of warnings, but in the end were very careful not to shoot down a single U.S. missile, let alone to sink a U.S. ship. So President Trump basically stared Mr. Putin down. And actually, that's the last point I want to make, and there's a question Rochelle wanted to address specifically. What is more valuable to Mr. Putin? Statements of false moral equivalence or sanction relief which is not forthcoming? And I will finish with another striking example, and this is the example of Israeli Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu, Benjamin Netanyahu, who came to Russia on Russian Victory Day. He marched with Putin, in celebratory columns, and the very next day the Israelis wiped out nearly all Iranian air defense systems in Syria. They had typically Iranian names like Pantsir, Buk, Dvina, uh, the famous book that is uh, superb, as we know, against uh, civilian airliners, uh, but that did not perform, it seems, as well against Israeli F-16s. And again, Putin did not as much as Bip. So this shows that PR reality, that is, Israeli Prime Minister marching alongside with him, was much more important to Putin than the real thing. And actually, at Deir Azor, we could see that Putin does not want a real war. He does not want a short, victorious war, which he has ample grounds to believe will be neither short nor victorious. What he wants is a PR war, a war in which he has all the advantages and none of the setbacks. And it is to Russia to fear the conventional war and not the West. So there are two basic advantages of the current administration. President Trump is not afraid to use force, and he is unpredictable. This is his greatest asset and his greatest liability, because actually unpredictability in foreign policy is associated with authoritarian leaders. It is an authoritarian leader who can flip and flop back and forth, who can turn in two days to 100 degrees. The democracy is a ponderous thing to turn. So it turns out that what is probably the last line is that Mr. Trump is superbly equipped to deal with Bali's because he is not a small Bali himself. And it is a good thing in a world of Bali's. Okay, thank you guys for that. I just want to start off with uh, a little bit of discussion before we go to question and answer. Um, uh, Herman and Alina both mentioned the problem of Trump's statements alienating uh, European allies over things such as trade as well as Russia recently, we see. Um, I'm wondering if you think that these squabbles on other issues that maybe aren't directly related to Russia might uh, cripple U.S. policy by making Russia appear more favorable in comparison and in, in for this sort of thing, it would just mean that, you know, Trump says, do the Europeans place more value on what Trump says than, than what's actually going on? I don't know if any of you want to speak to that. Russian economic penetration, especially of Germany, uh, plays a, a big factor into how our relationships with Europe as a whole will play out, and to the extent that uh, uh, statements are made by the president that are subject to uh, a variety of interpretations. I think it strengthens the hand of pro-Western forces within Germany. Having said that, uh, eventually Europe will have to come to uh, grips with the reality of uh, Russian aggression. They'll have to come to uh, grips with the need to defend themselves. They'll have to come to grips with the Russian propaganda, which will become less rather than more effective as uh, greater portions of the European elite and European uh, intelligentsia understands 
how they're being lied to and how their own individual uh, internal political processes are being manipulated. So I think that the, the bigger question you're asking, uh, Rachel, is whether uh, President Trump's statements and uh, potential alienation of our European allies is kind of pushing them towards Russia. Yeah, right? and undermining our own. And our interests in, in, in our, and Policies. the alliance, transatlantic yeah. alliance. I don't think those are related. There have been so-called putin uh in Germany for a very long time. Um, among the central left, uh, Gerhard Schroeder stands out as the number one, uh, who is the former chancellor of the SPD, the Social uh, Democratic Party of Germany, who now, uh, at the, within a month of uh, losing his election in Germany, uh, became uh, chairman of the board of Gazprom and now also serves a similar position for the Russian uh, state oil monopoly, Rosneft and continually lobbies for uh, Kremlin interests within Germany, including for Nord Stream 2, uh, the pipeline project uh, that would make Europe deeply uh, dependent uh, on Russian gas for many years to come and would cut Ukraine out from transit fees. Uh, same thing in, in Italy. Uh, we now have a new government uh, composed of right-wing populists, uh, but League and the Five Star Movement, who have for a very long time been pro-Russian, very clearly. Um, and we have these similar kinds of political forces essentially across all European countries today. So that was happening before the U.S. elections in 2016 in Europe. It's been happening at least since the 1990s, frankly. Um, and the Russian government, as part of its asymmetric warfare against the West, has strategically cultivated alliances and relationships with fringe political parties primarily on the right, but also on the left. Um, as Yulia was saying, this is part of the chaos strategy. Um, it's not about choosing a specific individual or associating yourself with a specific ideology. Um, it's about chaos, right? So you support uh, challenger insurgent political forces on both sides. Uh, so my last comment is that Putin, though, is, I think, very good at seeing power vacuums and divisions and then knowing how to insert himself into those divisions between allies um, or between member states within the EU itself. And we saw him doing this recently. So uh, just at the end of May, uh, Russia hosted the St. Petersburg uh, Economic Forum to which President Macron attended directly after this uh, very uh, well-publicized bromance uh, with President <laughs> Trump that he had here. Uh, Angela Merkel also flew to meet with President Putin in Moscow. We don't actually know why. There was, uh, I didn't see an official readout as to the purpose of the visit. And what was interesting is that Putin greeted her with a bouquet of roses. And in the past, he's greeted her uh, with his black Labrador retriever because she, she has a fear of dogs. Uh, so this is a very marked uh, change in how Putin himself, I think, was trying to court uh, European allies. He then himself went to Austria uh, for a series of meetings. Austria is also a country like Germany that has its share of Putin for share. And he's been doing this, cultivating these kinds of relations, relationships to try to pull away um, some of the European allies from the United States. So yes, the tensions that we currently have in the relationship, Putin is trying to step in to make those divisions wider. But is the uh, Trump policy actually pushing Europeans towards Russia? I, I think these trends have been going on in Europe for a very long time. Probably I would add, uh, I would add that uh, the roses thing, uh, the, this uh, roses bouquet thing was uh, quite controversial because uh, this means he uh, presented it to a woman and not to a head of state. So there was a lot of discussion about this as well, whether it was intended as insult after the Labrador. Uh, we, nobody saw the Labrador around. Probably it uh, probably died. <laughs> so. Uh, actually, I would uh, also agree that uh, Putin is very good at exploding cracks, and uh, this is why it is important uh, not to overestimate, uh, the, not, not to ascribe to him all the uh, 
all the divisions that are happening both in European and American society, because the cracks are here for real. The cracks are about serious issues. And if you don't want Kremlin to be inserted into these cracks, uh, then the Western world should really address the issues. For instance, immigration is a very serious issue uh, in Europe. And if the current mainstream parties don't address the issue, then of course the marginal parties would. And it is not a good uh, thing to explain all these things. Oh, it's just Putin's influence and Putin's money. Otherwise, we'll be behaving themselves uh, just as silly as the Kremlin when it says, well, all the Russian opposition is financed by the United States and there's no real ground to, for discontent. And one more thing I want to talk about since we are here in Congress is the role of Congress uh, in policy towards Russia. Uh, I know we mentioned CATSA, which Trump signed and eventually implemented. Um, but that, of course, did originate uh, in Congress. And I was wondering if any of you saw that as a kind of uh, insurance policy, maybe uh, in case Trump did something or said something, uh, you know, in the beginning of, of his presidency, uh, there were thoughts that he might actually get rid of the sanctions. So uh, what do you think uh, Congress's role is uh, in light of CATSA as well as possible future endeavors? I know that that bill which uh, uh, passed with large bipartisan majorities was signed by uh, Trump. He could have let it go into law without signing it. So. Uh, I think uh, the charge that he wasn't going along with it is uh, not completely accurate. If he really had strong objections, he would not have signed it. I think there remains skepticism in Congress regarding how hard a line the president will continue to take on Donbass and other situations in the world. And uh, the large bipartisan majority, I think, uh, uh, certainly will be a, a factor in uh, shaping policy because it's a reality of power in DC. I actually think right now is uh, a really important moment for Congress, uh, which typically is not as involved in foreign policy as which is the domain of the executive in the United States, uh, to play a much more leading role when it comes to Russia. And Congress has done this with Katza uh, very, very clearly by stepping in uh, to fill what I think some members of Congress probably saw as a potential threat that this administration moved quickly to remove sanctions. Certainly, candidate Trump talked about that uh, during the campaign. So I think that was a fear that many uh, congressional members had at the time. I don't think that was the main motivator uh, for CATSA because it was so much more expansive um, than just codifying the Obama era executive orders related to sanctions. It could have just done that but it went much, much further um, and actually gave the administration uh, significant mandate and authority to impose new sanctions related to energy, related to uh, f financial, um, illicit, illicit finance from Russia, and also related to the defense and intelligence sector. And they have used those authorities. Um, again, they didn't have to use them. Uh, the, the Kremlin, so-called Kremlin list that the administration released as part of CATSA at the end of January, uh, the public version, uh, was a bit of a joke because it was basically a culmination of a Forbes list and then uh, added with some Russian officials from the Kremlin.ru website. But the classified version, which I have not seen, but I've talked to people who have, and maybe some of you have, um, was a real report that was well done, well researched, and I have no doubt the sanctions that came afterwards that we talked about um, in early April that were really tough were based on that classified information and net assessments about specific individuals and companies uh, that are uh, involved in some of the dirty dealings um, of the Kremlin's hybrid war. So I think there's a lot more that Congress can still do, um, but specifically much more in the, what we've all been talking about in this uh, hybrid war, asymmetric warfare space. Um, we haven't done very much to really understand how American tech firms like Facebook and Twitter and Google have played a significant role in propagating Russian propaganda and disinformation alongside so-called fake news. I, I was frankly a bit disappointed 
a bit um, with the Mark Zuckerberg hearings that happened in Congress. Uh, they didn't really get to the heart of the matter. And I think this industry uh, and the role that it served in being manipulated by the Kremlin uh, will continue to be an issue. And at some point, regulatory measures will have to come in the same way the regulatory measures came over television and radio and print. Um, and so this is, I think, a place where Congress can continue to have a very important role in understanding how do we get the situation under control because it's not getting any better based on the voluntary actions of these companies. And Herman, do you want to make a quick statement here? Uh, there's been a long and very vigorous debate among constitutional scholars about the role in national security of Congress versus the executive branch. And the reason it's been so vigorous is there's a lot of ambiguity in the Constitution. In practice, when the executive branch or Congress has gone so far, uh, the opposing branch has made a big effort to reassert its rights on things like war powers, but uh, not only. And my personal view is in recent years, uh, Congress has abdicated a lot of power it could exert if there was will to do so. And you'll no comments? That's fine. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so we're going to turn it over to the audience. Um, so for question and answers, uh, please state your name and your affiliation and keep it brief. I also want to hear actual questions rather than comments. Uh, if you keep going for too long, I will cut you off. So if anyone has any questions. Yes. Uh, we have a microphone here. Come in. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Kristen Chang. I'm with the office of Senator Schumer. I'm an intern there. Dr. Polyakova, you spoke briefly on um, the Facebook's impact on what's happening, what we're looking at. I was wondering if I could get all of your thoughts on how we should move forward with the cybersecurity threat. Um, I know you've spoken a little bit about that, but I'd love to hear more about it if you have anything else to say. Thank you. Uh, if, yeah, if anyone wants to respond, not required, but. Well, I, I, I do think what I mentioned um, about the role of social media companies is different than the cybersecurity element. They're intertwined um, by different. So when we're talking about this spread of disinformation, which is different than misinformation, is the intentional spread of inaccurate information to try to manipulate societies and certain narratives, which is what the Kremlin has been doing, um, but also others have been doing. Um, and that's different than just um, you know, putting up uh, false stories for make, to make a little bit of money from advertising. Um, so I think we have to separate those. Um, and, and the cyber uh, threats question, um, I think a lot of the actions on that end have to happen in the classified space and have to be led by the intelligence community. Uh, for obvious reasons. And as a result, I don't know exactly, um, because I don't have clearance, on uh, what we have already done in that space. Um, but I would hope that um, DOD, along with ODNI, are thinking through their own vulnerabilities. Um, I was happy to see that early in the administration, uh, they banned the use of Kaspersky Lab software on um, USG computers. Uh, that was a good first step, but that was a small first step. I think the bigger threat in the cybersecurity domain um, is not as much Russia um, as China. And what we've seen Russia actually become is more of a hub for cyber criminals, uh, which the Russian government sometimes uses to do its own things um, and its own projects. Uh, but I also think that this is a really deeply complex issue, I'm not giving a satisfying answer, but I think that's because a lot of the actions have to happen in the intelligence space. Um, and if any of you are working for the intel communities, I would hope that you're thinking through this. The American Foreign Policy Council has run a series of briefings on cybersecurity, I think. 52 Senate offices uh, attended uh, those briefings over the past year, and we have uh, them summarized in a primer on cybersecurity, and there's also a full book that's gotten rave reviews from Harvard Law. And if anybody in the audience wants to do a deep dive on it, uh, talk to Amanda Eisenhower, if she raises her hand from AFPC, and uh, we'll get them to you. <laughs> 
I would just like to add up a couple of things. Uh, maybe not many people remember, but uh, the first attack uh, that ever happened, uh, uh, that ever was devised by Kremlin, uh, was, so, was in Estonia, and it was called Bronze Soldier Riots. Uh, when the Estonian government uh, decided uh, to move uh, a monument uh, to Russian, uh, uh, well, uh, to Russian liberators, who liberated Estonia from Nazis, and at the same time, uh, uh, included it into Soviet Union uh, to another place, and uh, uh, the, besides the attacks, uh, or the attacks uh, besides the riots, there was immediate uh, cyber attacks uh, on Estonian e-government. And as Estonia has uh, one of the most advanced systems of e-government in the world, uh, this was of course uh, quite dangerous, and this led to the fact that uh, right now uh, the cyber security uh, center of NATO is situated in Estonia. Uh, I would like to point out about this Estonian thing two things. Uh, first, uh, the tech, uh, the bronze soldier rights were actually organized in a very interesting way. I tried to pay some attention to the detail, and that's what I found out. Uh, that actually uh, uh, it was a perfect setup because what happened is that a lot of Russians who live in Estonia they listen to Russian state TV and the Russian state TV started announcing that they peop that people are rioting and after it started announcing that people are rioting and publishing news about it they came and rioted it was as simple as that and actually I think it was perfect uh, type of uh, an organization of an event. And uh, uh, that's, uh, that's one thing to think about, uh, that Russian cyber war actually started uh, then uh, with Estonia, and Estonia is a member of NATO. Uh, and uh, actually I think that uh, Russia can be dangerous when it comes to cyber attacks. And actually uh, there's one thing I never uh, mentioned, I, I never uh, heard any consequences and any news after it happened because several weeks before the uh, American presidential uh, elections, uh, there was a huge d DOS attack, distributed denial of service attack, on various American commercial servers, and they went down. And actually, uh, well, somebody said, yes, it's probably due to Russia, and it was not followed up. And I think this is actually much more serious uh, than Russian fake news because I think there's a lot of hype about Russian fake news and what's happening in Twitter and in Facebook. And I'll tell you one thing. There's one case that's malicious, there's one thing that is malicious intent. And there was obviously these troll farms who were trying to uh, meddle in. Uh, but there is another thing that is a real influence. And I don't think they exerted any real influence for one very specific thing. Here I am I, uh, sitting before you, and talking in English. And my English is not a native language, and despite the fact that I'm a fairly good speaker, and I read in English more than Russian, I certainly cannot pass as a Native American in my Facebook messages. So don't you believe for a second that Russian people, Russian Facebook trolls, uh, who are uneducated, who don't even have the level of English I have, can pass for an American. It's as simple as that. As I said, there's a question of malicious uh, intent, and the intent is something that also should be punished, but there's also a question of real influence, which is almost negligible. In Russian the law, there's a specific thing for this. It's uh, an attempt uh, with the means that are not sufficient for the attempt. I don't know whether such a thing exists in uh, American law. <laughs> Okay, another question? Right there. Thank you. Hi, Brooke Hartsoff with the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission. Continuing the topic with hybrid warfare, um, with Wagner's private military company operating in southwestern Syria in ties to Putin's regime, and then obviously their attack behind um, on U.S. troops in Syria in February of this year, um, this making it the deadliest U.S.-Russian class clash since the Cold War. As private military companies um, have shown ties to Putin's regime, what does this mean for the future of US-Russian relations and military action? 
Well, first of all, I think we should understand that uh, private military company and Russia are actually, actually two not very compatible things. Uh, because if you look at Russian regime carefully, well, uh, Kremlin nationalized everything, beginning with oil and uh, going uh, down to TV. So it begs belief uh, that uh, uh, a leader who is as intent as Putin is on governing anything in his country uh, leaves a private military company operating like in some medieval times. There are no private uh, military companies that go to war in uh, the present uh, day world, except, as I've said, for medieval times, uh, because, because obviously the state monopoly or violence is one thing that makes state tick. Uh, so I think that instead of private military companies, we should talk of uh, the policy of plausible deniability by Mr. Putin. He wants to create a common structure mm -hmm in which he will not be held responsible for what is happening under his broad guidance. And I think that this possible, what Putin wants is diminished liability. And actually what he gets, this is also true, is a diminished control. Because in things like shooting down Malaysian Boeing, or maybe even at this day resort thing, we cannot be 100% sure uh, that Putin controlled the whole of the operation uh, because he had definitely given an umbrella permission. But unfortunately, when people get arms into their hands, and that's a private gun, a guy who has these arms, he starts going after his own goals, after his own goals. I will uh, like you to, to attract your attention, which to, to, to a piece you probably know. There's a very perfect piece in Washington, uh, in, uh, Washington Post uh, on actually what happened at De Resort. Uh, because uh, they, it had some leaked information, and this leaked information was as following. That first, Mr. Prigozhin, this is the guy who is the head of, uh, who is the nominal head of this Wagner Brigade, uh, who is responsible for it, uh, for the upkeep of it, uh, that first Mr. Prigozhin was contacted by some Syrian, uh, uh, some Syrian official who promised him reward uh, for doing this. And then Mr. Prigozhin contracted a man whose name was Mr. Ostrovenka, and Mr. Ostrovenka uh, was a deputy to the, uh, head, uh, to the chief of staff of, Russia, of Mr. Putin's administration. So what I'm trying to point out that actually for an operation that is planned from the top, it's sort of a very roundabout way of uh, uh, carrying out an operation, uh, because you know, Mr. Prigozhin is no military himself. And he's contacting a guy who is, God forbid, the civilian uh, deputy of the chief of staff of Mr. Putin. Uh, so what do I make out of it? Uh, that's, that's my, uh, of course, I just can't suppose it. But what do I make out of it? Is that uh, Mr. Prigozhin has got a sort of umbrella permission and go ahead from Mr. Putin. Uh, then he sorted out the details with these Syrian guys and he was promised some remuneration, which is okay uh, by Kremlin. It is uh, not uh, something that is not permitted. It is okay. Uh, so then uh, he contacted Ostrovenka in order to inform him of the details of operation because he had no direct access to Mr. Putin himself right at this time. And he was doing this because Mr. Shoigu, that's the Russian Minister of Defense, hates his guts, which is just obvious, you know, because when you have a private military contract and a regular army, they hate each other's guts. Uh, and uh, he wanted to sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, have an insurance policy in case to, 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 uh, to in case the things go south. Uh, so actually, the things went south, and Mr. Prigozhin was probably able to say, "Well, Mr. Shoigu sanctioned this." So this is a very, very roundabout way. And what I'm trying to say that this is all goes under the heading of plausible deniability and the resultant diminished control. So this is just exactly intended, so we could not sort head or tail of it and understand, was Kremlin really responsible for trying to, uh, uh, for trying to attack U.S. troops? Or was it just a, uh, you know, a freak? Uh, 
And I think it's important that this plausible deniability is understood to exist in Ukraine as well. This whole fantasy of separatists, they make no mistake, the operation there is Russian planned, financed, equipped, directed, uh, officer corps, all Russian. But under the uh, umbrella of deniability, even though there's full control out of Moscow. And if you have somebody local that gets out of line, as happened in Donbass, they get assassinated and everybody else gets in line. Just very briefly, because you asked about what does this mean for the future, uh, I think Yulia's uh, detail of the Wagner uh, conflict in Syria uh, is absolutely correct. And but what it points to is this plausible deniability leads inevitably to warfare by proxy. Um, whether that be in the conventional space, which is the situation with Ukraine and, and the Syria example, and also in the non-conventional space, meaning the use of cyber criminals, um, activists, uh, as Mr. Putin volunteers, patriotic volunteers, as Mr. Putin has called them, um, and the, in the disinformation space as well. So there's no, co there's not, it may be a coincidence, but it's interesting that Prigozhin was also uh, in charge of the IRA, the Troll Factory Project, and the Wagner Group, right? Um, so it's, it seems that there is a um, system of control that is ambiguous, purposely ambiguous, where a certain guidance or directive is given from the Kremlin, from Mr. Putin, but then the details are figured out on the ground, and sometimes things go wrong, and the Kremlin can deny it, and sometimes they go well, they can take some credit for it, which is what happened with Crimea eventually. Um, Though Crimea might be a slightly different example. And I think we're going to see more and more and more of this. And I think the role, what does that mean for policy? It means that European and American policymakers have to be much more clear about pointing the finger, even if you don't have, you know, smoking gun attribution. So uh, this administration did that with the Nazi PTA attacks, uh, where they clearly said this was a responsibility of the GRU, the Russian military intelligence, and we need to do more of this. Instead of being fearful about saying, uh, as the Obama administration was during Ukraine, uh, where I remember in 2014, no one was willing to use the war, uh, Russian war invasion. The favorite term was crisis. I was like, we, we know it wasn't a crisis, this was a war, but nobody was willing to say those words, and now we have a very different situation. Those words are being used, and the reality is being spoken about, and we need more of this kind of communication. Um, oh, there. Hi, my name is Paul Massaro. Uh, I'm the policy advisor for anti-corruption at the Helsinki Commission, and thank you all so much for being here today. Uh, Dr. Polyakova, thank you for pointing out the parasitic, kleptocratic nature of the Putin regime. Uh, something that we talk about quite a lot in the circles I run in is the way that those that steal all this money need to go then and hide it in the West, and, and hide it in a rule of law country for a number of reasons. Three that come to mind are, so the next bigger fish won't steal it, so your people don't see it necessarily, and uh, so you can hedge, of course, against the collapse of the regime. And that's something that, uh, that Herman, you, put, you pointed out. Uh, um, so my, my question is, when it comes to those within the United States and perhaps in the United Kingdom that assist in the transfer of this wealth and the hiding of this wealth, and then perhaps also the middlemen that clean this money in Cyprus and Latvia, you know, what has the administration done and what can the administration do further uh, seeing as, you know, this is truly the Achilles heel of the Putin regime. Thanks for your question. Just a quick comment. Um, but all of us have talked about this to a certain extent because this, this is the area of focus, um, to, my, to my mind, um, that will really get at the heart of the, the, the Kremlin um, under Putin. Uh, I think there's a few things that can be done. Uh, clearly, the UK has a serious problem with, with dirty Russian money. Um, it's, I would say, probably less of a problem in the United States, although certainly in New York, in Miami, um, and in Delaware, um, there, uh, in New York and Miami, there are these empty apartment buildings that we all know about now uh, that have been bought up with, as a way to clean dirty money, basically. Um, and what is this doing uh, to real estate prices? It's very obvious that normal citizens can't afford to live in these places because prices are going up. I think most citizens, whether it be in the UK, in Europe, or in the US, are not making those connections, right? That one reason, not 
one reason why you can't afford an apartment um, in Miami is because of this dirty money that's just being parked there and these apartments are empty. Uh, but the, the real estate doesn't exist. One major thing that worries me about the UK because of Brexit is that the UK's financial system has become so deeply dependent on this foreign money, not just from Russia, from, other, from China as well and elsewhere. Uh, but as they exit, supposedly, the European Union, they will, be, they will inevitably have capital flight. And as a result, they will need to be much more dependent on attracting this kind of money to maintain the current financial uh, prestige that London City has acquired. And so the UK is considering much more strict um, legislation that will specifically point to uh, the identifying transparency and disclosures around f the final beneficiary of accounts. Uh, we still have that loophole here, um, and it's one of the few places we have that loophole, but I think to get rid of these shell companies, which it's really complicated, um, you have to have clear laws about disclosing the final beneficiary of accounts. And that, I think, would also go for funding of political ads as well online, where you can't set up a shell company or a shell group to put out a political ad like uh, Muslim, United Muslims for America uh, by some, you know, uh, Americans for Puppies kind of organization or something. So I think that's also somewhere where Congress could act um, to uh, enforce those kinds of disclosures. Congress should take a look at the laws that were put into place during the last days of uh, Cameron before May came to power. And they require substantial disclosure of where the money originated, the source of the money. As uh, Alina uh, pointed out, uh, they haven't been implemented because of uh, the penetration of Russian money into uh, uh, the coffers of the Tory party and the, and the Labour party, and many legitimate businessmen make money out of uh, the Russian oligarchs that are there. I was in London, uh, I don't know, maybe five, six weeks ago, and I understand that debate, the debate is alive on how far they should go to implement these laws. But there are pretty good laws in the books, and it may be worth a, a, a look-see for those of you that are on staff here to see what uh, may have applicability here. Just as a follow-up, law firms are also being used as money laundering organizations. And there's also... Uh, because they don't have to disclose because of client confidentiality privilege uh, where their money is coming from. So what happens is oligarch X, company Y, you know, transfers uh, millions to a law firm, which is, just seen, is recorded as client fees. And the law firm, by law, does not have to reveal where that money comes from, what it was for. Um, and that also sets up, it's not just real estate, and it's not just bank account holdings that we need disclosures around. And this is why Delaware has, been, has become, oddly, a place where uh, there's a high concentrations of these firms that are being used to launder money. Just one thing I would like to add. What I think is, first of all, you need to do about Russian money is to differentiate. Uh, because uh, if you use the highest ethical standards, that all Russian money is dirty money, uh, because uh, you know everything in United, uh, everything in Soviet Union was state property, and the minute it was privatized, I can assure you that no Russian oligarch with his metal was paying any taxes, and I know very well how they were going around about not paying it, and of course, even in Yeltsin's time, they were all using administrative resource to get more money. And I will concede that this is normal because business is not about politics. Business is about making profits. And if the guy could make more profits by using administrative resource, he was using it. So if we don't differentiate between the people who say well, oligarchs became oligarchs under Yeltsin in a sort of corrupt but competitive, in a sort of what can be called competitive corruption, Yes, and uh, people who became oligarchs uh, simply because they be were Putin's friends or was because they were Putin's official who were just taking money as bribes, then we're doing a very bad thing because actually if we judge by high aesthetic standards, we should ask ourselves a question. What would Rockefeller or Vanderbilt do if he were born in Russia and he were a businessman in Russia in 90s? And probably he would behave very much like, uh, say, a guy whom I don't like, like Mr. Deripaska or other guys. Uh, so uh, I first, uh, I think that actually 
uh, each case should be treated individually, and when it's individually, it means uh, it's not treated by a law, but it's treated by a special service. And a special service looks into the guy, and maybe even he's a Putin, even if he's a Putin official, and all his money is stolen. And maybe if it can make a deal with him, and he will rattle on his comrades, maybe it is better to make a deal. Mm. Okay, I'm going to see if I can go to this side of the room, won't discriminate, in the front here. So hello, my name is William Lee. I'm with Senator Murkowski's office in Alaska. So several weeks ago, the Ukrainian government executed a sting operation against involving um, anti-Kremlin journalist Akhredi Babchenko. So my question for you is, what do you think this tells us about Eastern European states' efforts to resist Russian expansion, and perhaps what can we do to help them? The Babchenko case uh, is really interesting. Thanks for that question. Um, and, and highly controversial, obviously. Um, Aside from that case, which was a very specific, uh, had a lot of unique characteristics to it, there have been many, many assassinations or attempted assassinations of critics of the Putin regime who went to Ukraine um, to escape persecution because they're fearful for their lives. I think Yulia can speak to that in more detail than I can. But there's been a long standing pattern um, of Russian independent journalists being harassed, being killed, um, even if they leave Russia. Uh, so the Babchenko case is different from that. Babchenko is, is a cr Russian journalist, controversial in Russia as well, uh, who went to Ukraine because uh, he said he had fears for his own safety. Um, what happened in that operation, uh, as was, was, I think, basically a botched PR media operation uh, by the Ukrainian intelligence services. Um, so I don't know if all of you are familiar with it, but just very quickly, uh, so Babchenko, the journalist, was living in Ukraine at the time from Russia. Um, there's a big report comes out that he's been killed, um, shot, but then 24 hours later, after every single Western media source has reported that this was uh, the Russian intelligence services, he appears uh, giving a press conference alive and well, and the Ukrainian intelligence services say, well, this was a sting operation to try to catch his actual assassins. Um, a lot of questions have been raised about that, um, but in terms of was this really a good thing to do? Was it a reputational risk for the U Ukrainian intelligence authorities? Um, should they have taken on that risk because it made them look like they were spreading fake news? My comment on that is there's a very big difference between a strategic intent to undermine and try to influence narratives and discourses in societies over time, which is what the Kremlin has been doing, versus a discrete intelligence operation which you could say has been botched because it didn't really communicate well. So it's two very different cases um, that we can point to. I think the bigger picture, though, is that the, the message that many of those who dissent to the, to the Putin regime um, is that you're not safe anywhere anymore. And that goes true for uh, former intelligence operatives uh, like Skripal. Uh, that goes true for many Russian journalists. Um, and I think this is just the reality that we live in. Yes, I agree completely. It's important to note that Putin feels vulnerability, and that's why he has the need to make examples of anybody that sticks their head up to dissent. If he were totally secure, he could ignore them. Just address a little bit specifically the Babchenko case. Uh, because uh, just as Alina have said, uh, there were many people who were killed in Ukraine, including with Pavel Sheremet, a very famous journalist. Another case was Denis Voronenkov, uh, not a very good guy and actually uh, a fraudster, uh, but a fraudster who claimed to fight uh, Putin's regime and uh, who was killed for it. Uh, there were two attempts on the life of a guy called Akuyev, that's the Chechen field commander, uh, actually an Islamist uh, who was uh, fighting on the Ukrainian side. There were two attempts on the life of Anton Gerashenko. This is, uh, we can roughly say that this is PR secretary for the Ministry of Internal Affairs. Uh, so the Babchenko case uh, seemed perf perfectly believable, and I don't classify it as fake news. I classify it as a sting operation, uh, and actually I can uh, claim that I believe the majority of things the Ukrainian uh, intelligence uh, uh, says about the operation. 
But the biggest problem with me is precisely this world belief. Because as a journalist, uh, and especially in an age uh, where there's video recordings, audio recordings, I don't have to believe anything. I have to know the facts. And now instead of the real proof, electronic proof, uh, the, the Ukrainian intelligence services just ask us, us to believe that this is the culprit, uh, this is the organizer, and these are the guys uh, who, are in Russia was, who were in Russia were standing behind this. And uh, so I think that uh, they, the Ukrainian intelligence definitely underperformed, that they should have continued with the case, that it cannot be argued that this is just a sting operation and everything will be evident during the trial, because it was as much a PR operation as a sting one. Uh, so the minute we found out that Babchenko is alive, we had to see the proof. And if we are not seeing the proof, uh, as I said, it's probably not a sign that it was, uh, you know, fake, but it's uh, probably a sign that Ukrainian services, as usual, I would say, performed very, very much under, underperformed. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. So are there any more questions? If there aren't, ah, oh, there's one here. I'm Viola Ganger. I'm a, a writer and reporter um, and editor for Just Security, uh, the blog at uh, NYU Law. And I'm wondering about, there have been some comments in recent months by US officials um, to the extent of Russia continuing its operations in the United States disinformation operations in advance of the midterm elections. Do you have any sense of what entities are in charge and running those? And has there been any information about any replacement for the Internet Research Agency? Well, uh Actually, right now there are just rumors. I haven't seen uh, any clear facts. Uh, but I would like to point out two things. Uh, just recently, Mr. Putin has been asked by an Australian journalist about the activities of Mr. Prigozhin. Uh, yes, and he replied uh, that, uh, well, the United States have George Soros, and I have my Mr. Prigozhin. That was basically his contention. That, uh, you know, and as I said, this is a what picture of the world in which Mr. Putin lives. As I said, he really believes that the United States are standing behind everything bad that's, uh, everything that problematic that's happening in Russia. Uh, and he's really thinking George Soros to be the agent of United States government. Uh, I just forgot uh, whose personal cook, uh, whose president's personal cook George Soros was. <laughs> Maybe he earned his money by cooking for President Bush. I sort of forgot. Uh, uh, so uh, that's one thing. Uh, this is a very clear picture of uh, Putin uh, uh, that uh, Mr. Putin pr uh, is uh, thinking about. Uh, th that's what Mr. Putin is thinking about. That's how he believes the world to function. And the second thing uh, which we were not talking about and which is actually very important in Russia is that uh, we all think all these operations as pursuing some political gains. But for a lot of people who are carrying out these operations, it is just an operation to earn some money. And actually the reason these operations go horribly wrong when it comes to killing or when it comes to infiltrating or when it comes to fake news is precisely that there's a lot of money who, which comes from the top and then it sort of tickles to a, a very, very shallow stream because a lot of money get appropriated at the top and uh, the guy who carries out the operation just gets peanuts and for peanuts you can hire only a guy who is not very good. Uh, so uh, if we think of this fake news propaganda machine uh, as a machine that is earning money and producing money for the people who operate it, that means it will stay in operation precisely because they need something to show for their efforts and later claim, say, war contracts uh, or other things uh, because they'll say, okay, we spent so much money on this, we did such a great thing, please give us some money. So I think, I think it, 
it is not the kind of operation that can be wound down. And uh, the only thing that can be really done is that when Russia, when if, uh, if the United States does not discern whether it is Putin or somebody beneath him and puts responsibility square on the guy who is responsible for the general thing. And I think it's important to remember that this isn't anything new during the whole Cold War. The Soviet Union, uh, to greater or lesser extent, interfered in U.S. elections. What's different now is you have uh, social media and the computers and so much more that can be done than could be done in the days of paper and carrying around bags of cash. Just a very quick comment. I, if you're interested in this question of what specifically can Congress do on this information front, disinformation front, um, there's a paper I wrote recently with Ambassador Daniel Fried, who used to be the U.S. sanctions coordinator um, and served for 40 years in the U.S. government, called Democratic Defense Against Disinformation, um, that lays out just policy recommendations for the U.S. Congress. Um, and the other compendium to it is uh, the future of political warfare, which looks at uh, the emerging threats that are coming in this space. But that's just a plug for that. No problem. All right. Um, thank you guys for coming and hope it was equal parts entertaining and informational. <laughs>